Dr. Rajesh Beni, practicing neurologist at uh, Mumbai. And today, I have this privilege of having a chat with Dr. Satish Khadilkar. Dr. Satish Khadilkar needs no introduction, and most of us in the field of medicine and neurology know him for many, many years. He has been a doyen, he has been a teacher par excellence, and many of us as students have attended his extremely popular Thursday clinics and you needed to actually reserve seats to go and attend them. Dr. Khadilkar has inspired dozens like me to get interested in neurology and take up neurology because of his easy style of making complex neurological issues look very, very easy. I have been a student for the past two decades and I continue to learn from him. Dr. Satish Khadilkar likes to have everything organized in life. So though I know the professor in Dr. Satish Khadilkar, I actually don't know many things about his personal life which he likes to keep close to his heart. So going with his uh, structured uh, way of life, this meeting would also have some basic structure. But I would like to also throw in some unsuspecting questions so we can learn some different aspect of Dr. Satish Khadilkar. It is with utmost pleasure and awe that I sit in front of a living legend in neurology and I would try and unravel his life and see what we can learn from his illustrious journey. So Professor Khadika, most of us have been stalking your neurology career very, very closely, but we hardly know about your childhood days. So can you tell us something about it? Firstly, thank you Rajesh for this uh, uh, very graceful introduction. <coughs> Uh, I really don't know how it applies to me in, in many ways, but yes. Um, I would also like to thank the IAM for arranging this program because we'll get to know how different people have worked and what they have done. So your question is about early life. You will be very surprised to know how my early schooling has gone. In the fourth standard, I joined the military school the military school and I went there for a week or 10 days and then my grandfather said no this is not for this boy let him come back home so I came back home then I went into technical education where my subjects were smithy foundry turning fitting things like that at the end of which when I was in seventh standard the headmaster in the school said this boy is good he can do something in the SSC board these subjects are not good for him. Move him into mathematics. So I was moved from technical to two mathematics, two sciences, three languages, till 11th. Where in 11th, I sort of, according to his expectation, came into the uh, SSC merit list or whatever it was called at that time. And at that time, I thought my mathematics is good and sciences are good, and I'll take physics. And then for some reason, I moved it to medicine. So you see how much the movement is. So if you really ask me, as I look back at it, what does this movement really mean? This movement really means that you have to learn to apply yourself to what's given to you. I mean, of course there are people who will tell me that, look, I have this tremendous liking for this and I will not do anything else, but I think such people are few. Children just have to get the art and the knack of applying themselves and organizing themselves and the field really comes after that. That was the learning in the early period. Now, if you ask me why I came into medicine, I don't know. I came into medicine like so many of us have. Yeah, so that's the, that's the early part. Yeah. So, so it's, it's probably some twist of fate uh, which has got Dr. Thadilkar actually into the field of medicine and neurology and not a planned decision. And I, this is a very interesting thought probably to the youngsters who, like you said, have a one goal in mind and they want to do that and they don't have an alternate uh, explanation for what else they may want with life. But uh, you, you probably excel in whatever life throws at you and that's where uh, Dr. Khadilkar's thoughts do come in. Dr. Professor Khadilkar used to also, we used to also have this uh, legendary uh, Tuesday clinics in JJ. All of us uh, join neurology in JJ and then we wait to present cases in uh, neurology Tuesday clinics. 
and it was during one of these Tuesday clinics where I was doing my first year in neurology that the patient relatives were allowed to attend that clinics and uh, this patient relative got up, looked at Dr. Khadilkar and said, Are, your doctor, uh, your Satish Khadilkar? And sir said, yes. So he said, I know you very well. I know you very well from your school days and I hate you. And that got us by surprise. I said, he hates Dr. Khadilkar. No one can hate Dr. Khadilkar. So he said, no, sorry, I would like to correct myself. Not only me, the whole college hates him. <laughs> I said, what's happening? He said, this guy, you know him now as Professor Dr. Khadilkar, but I know him as an expert sportsman. He was an excellent badminton player. He is an excellent basketball player. And he said, whatever sports he would excel in, he would come top notch. So he stole up all the limelight from us. And uh, he's, he was an extremely popular person in school and in college in those days. That time we looked back at Sir and Sir used to be stony faced at that time, just uh, jotting points which happens in the neurology clinics, giving us tips how to approach that case. And that was the first time we saw a wry smile coming on his face. And that told us that there are, there are some other non-academic achievements which is kept very, very close to his heart. So can you actually now spill the beans <laughs> on your sports career? And actually how did you deviate from that career if you are doing so well? and foray into this field of medicine. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, there was a time when I actually wanted to be a sportsman. <laughs> and, uh, I think that stretch between 8th, nine standard to before coming into medicine or a little after coming into medicine, I, I was doing reasonably well. I represented the state of Maharashtra and junior nationals in badminton. And, uh, my dad had a business, so I thought to myself, why can't I just play as long as I can and achieve what, <laughs> whatever I can and just go and join dad and say, okay, sports is over now, I'll join you. Both my mom and dad said, no, you have to be good for something. You can't, you can't just be a sports person. So then I met some people, also people who coached me in, in badminton. There was one very good coach who, whom I was quite uh, impressed with. He said, look, the chances of success in sport are not as much as when you become a doctor in here. <laughs> if you want a sure shot like, drop the racket, take a book. So I, I must say I did struggle a while uh, between, uh, between these two options. And uh, looking back, I still struggle with it. I think it would have been uh, it would have been good to <laughs> good to explore uh, what one would be. Yeah. yeah, but that was another sort of um, um, a point where I had to decide. And again, the lesson here is most of us will choose what is sure success. So in reality, we are moving people into a kind of a regimentalization. Okay, you become a doctor, you become an engineer, you do this. So we're creating clones. Yes. So I think somewhere uh, we're losing out on creativity yes. by allowing people to, not allowing people to do what they want to do and allowing people to, I mean, not exactly not allowing people, but turning people to uh, what's more, a more certain way of. And that's why I think overall progress in any field gets a little stunted because you are just clones and robots you know, who are working just like other clones and robots. Thank you. That, that, that's a very interesting aspect of your life and I'm, I'm sure I'm also hearing it for the first time though I've known you for two decades now. Uh, Dr. Khadilkar, moving on from your school days, your sports uh, likings, can you tell us your life about your early medical college? and your PG days. This is before uh, you came into neurology. How was your life in MBBS? Where did you do your MBBS from? Yeah. I mean, I did it from the Government Medical College, Mirrors, the MBBS and MD. And like you said, very frankly, entering medicine was okay. I mean, I, like I told you, apply yourself, get masks, go. That's okay. I mean, that's the system that you follow. So when, you, when I came into medicine, I said, oh, this is what I need to do. I was shocked that I just, I'm just expected to mug up 
every tubercle on a bone and every fossa on thing. And what's it going to do? But no, you have to mug it up. Unless you mug up, you can't uh, score marks. Unless you score marks, you don't get PG. So firstly was the shock of the early medical education as to what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to mug up. I'm just supposed to produce uh, whatever mugging I have done. There's absolutely zero room for understanding of what is happening. And, and I think in early years, you're far away from understanding of the human body. Even today, you think you are far away from. So undergraduate, that was the feeling. Though. Why am I mugging? When I first started coming in contact with patients like we do with third MBBS and then internship and then a, I would say a second major shock came that medicine is completely disorganized. It's completely disorganized. I mean the ward work, the work methods, the round system, there's no organization anywhere and you're just putting in plugs. Whatever you're patching, you're patching. Whatever you can't patch, saying, sorry, I couldn't patch it. I mean, I couldn't come to terms with it for a long time. For example, of course, we had a very good boss. But he'll say, when the round started in the ICU, he'll say, bed number six, start blood. Bed number three, do this. And by the time another hour, when he said, have you started blood? Sir, I'm moving with you only. When am I going to start? <laughs> so there's no organization of anything. So another lesson I learned, that while intelligence expects and uh, covets organization, medicine is disorganized. You have to keep the organization away and say, okay, this is what will happen. Subsequently, when I, I married a gynecologist, so they are more disorganized than they are. <laughs> oh, when the pain starts, you tell me. Oh, my God, so what are you going to do till that time? <laughs> I have to wait. I'll do my other things. I'll take my rest by that time. So, I think that's another aspect of medicine, that it is disorganized and also it is unpredictable. That unpredictability also starts flustering you. I mean, I'm just, I've learned my books, I've read them again and again. This should happen, but something else is happening. So I think those are the turmoils of many of us, which uh, maybe I went through them a little more uh, strongly, but then I came to terms with it. Okay, this is what it is and let me try and make sense out of this. Okay. So, uh, like Dr. Khadilkar has uh, told us, and I think it will be heartening to know, not only to all of us, to him also, medicine is disorganized and it stays disorganized. And patients do catch you unawares. They never follow the book. I think they don't read books. <laughs> so, we have to learn to adapt to those changes. So, tell us about your face in life when you were a resident in Ward 23 of JJ Neurology. How did you enjoy your days in neurology there? And uh, uh, you can add on to who was your best influence at that time. Yeah. This is during your neurology days. I think uh, uh, in, in many ways I was exceptionally lucky because I came to the Gantt Medical College. I must say people have told me that if you want to do neurology, it is Gantt Medical College only. Don't take any others. And I had some other opportunities that I would mention them. So I came to Gantt Medical College. And, uh, Professor Singhal was the head of the department at that time. Professor Katrak was uh, the young and active uh, influence. And Professor Wadia had uh, just stopped coming to JJ. So all these three big luminaries were there. So I think I'll, we learned from everyone. And I think it was a real good time because uh, the bosses were exemplary. The colleagues were fantastic. And I think the overall atmosphere was of learning, teaching and the general medicine department. I mean, they would always look up to the neurology registrar and say, look, we're not understanding. So it, uh, you had that little pride, okay, okay, let me go to the medicine ward and see what's happening and often you could say something. So I think the formative years had a tremendous influence uh, of all the teachers. These three names and Dr. Neeta Mehta was there and uh, there were so many others in uh, the city of Bombay who from time to time you'd go and learn. So I think it was a very positive influence on uh, on, on uh, a developing mind at that time. Right. Right. What got you actually interested in myology then? Myology must have been such a nascent field. I, I, I think the, apart from clinical 
diagnosis that time in myology there would not be much happening in the city of mumbai and also probably in the whole of india so what got you yeah, into myology fields were just developing you could do whatever you uh, there was room to do, to do whatever specialty that you wanted to do but uh, i think some inherent liking because i used to go to pathology when in jj and look at the muscle slides under the microscope and dr dastur was there and he had again a tremendous influence on everyone his neuropathology was class a plus if there any there can't be anything better so again a little bit of influence of professor darab to and seeing the slides and some inherent liking i can't put my finger on why i chose that field or uh, what who chose the field but uh, but some kind of liking which i still have I, mean, i know that myopathy field is going slower than others in terms of treatments and developments but i still find it very intriguing as to how things happen and why they happen so a combination of both i think a little bit of inner liking a little bit of Professor Dastur's influence, and then it sort of moved on. See, in many ways, we are like water. Mind's least resistance. Let's say my my mind's least resistance was uh, for my opathies. <laughs> so, so yeah. I took it. That's why you were in Madras. Yeah. And and do you like to tell us a brief about your uh, stay when you went out of the country to? learn nerve yeah. and muscle any challenges yeah like like all of us uh, who do a stint outside india there are differences um, i must say i the main thing i learned was organization how people are how nicely they are organized how how they bite um, only limited areas and how they uh, sort of then how are they able to then chew it up and scientifically put um, experimentations uh, to prove what the point they're proving so I think the main gain from that stint, one was uh, broadening one's horizons, um, um, getting a little more organized about how things are done, particularly in research. Professor Byron Katulas was such a stalwart, and he had written books with the Raymond Adams, and he was very open to whoever came to him. So, never faced any real challenges. But uh, the challenge with Dr. Katulas was to bring yourself up to. Uh, a point of his expectation where he'll say okay well done that mm-hmm. took something and uh, there was a gap between where i stood at the end of dm and uh, how he so uh, so it sort of helped to raise oneself it helped to uh, broaden one's horizons to understand the system of research and that's where i think uh, we we uh, in who train in india are primarily clinicians with a little research angle uh, got him by so it was very fruitful but another the dilemma comes at the end of it to most of us are you going to go back to yes. go to bombay or are you going to stay there so again that dilemma we all have the same uh, issue so uh, so i chose to be here <laughs> so there were a lot of dilemmas throughout your entire life yes. i mean yeah and, and you chose well and, uh, and you have done uh, well, well well rajesh i don't i think choice is a part of it is how you apply yourself Absolutely. to what you have chosen yes. that decides what will happen yes so well you can there are bad choices and you can you can continue to blame them for the rest of your life but whatever you choose i think is the method of application yes. that so there are good choices and not so good choices yes. but it's up to you how you make the best out of them correct so dr khadilkar moving on i know that you have spent most of your working life between two major centers you were at the grand medical college and the jj group of hospitals where you have been the head of department of neurology from 2005 to 2016 and a better part of your life doing private practice in bombay hospital where you are also now the academic dean even right from your early days after you finished your uh, post graduation after coming back from your uh, fellowship in nerve and muscle disease how did you manage to divide your time so effectively between private practice and academic life we know in the city of mumbai it's extremely difficult you have to get a foothold on your career you managed to do well in academic life how did you do that and what what advice would you give to youngsters like you know firstly i must thank the opportunity that i got 
I think having an opportunity to be in the medical college in the day and be allowed to practice for the rest of the time is in itself a boon. And I think those of us who got it, we must be always grateful to the Lord for giving this opportunity. It makes you so much of a better person because you're seeing the academic aspect of things, the science behind it, and then you're coming out and seeing how patients react, what do they want, how are you going to put what you learnt in the morning yes. to what you're doing in the evening. So I think it's a very unique opportunity that Maharashtra State provided to people. And I wish they again restarted and allow people uh, to do academics as well as, uh, as well as practice. But research academics and clinical practice are three horses running in three different directions. <laughs> So if you try to ride them, yeah. then you have a problem because they are going in different directions. So I think then again, apportioning one's time as to uh, and understanding what you want to do from, see like from Grant Medical College, whatever work, uh, so-called scientific work we did, is basically clinical work. It's clinical research. Now. You cannot say that I will be in that medical college, but I will do very basic research and I will find out at the molecular level what is happening in these myopathies. So, you have to know what limitations are there within this fantastic opportunity and then work within them, like clinical research was, was the main field, but keeping records, organizing one's own time and then, then sort of coming in the evening to, to the practice where you fully understand the human minds. You know, what does this fellow want? He doesn't want to know what type of myopathy it is. He yes. wants to know how his life will be, what can he do. But seeing both the things definitely makes you a better individual. Yes, absolutely. So, we have to learn from you how to uh, balance this uh, two aspects of uh, life, which all of us would actually love to do that, but uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, Dr. Khadikar, everyone would vouch that you are a teacher par excellence and uh, uh, during any of your clinics, you will have some pearl of neurology to give us which stay in our mind uh, forever. Like I remember that when I was in my MD days, uh, I had attended your clinic probably once or twice. And I remember you saying, anyone who has uh, proximal limb weakness, autonomic dysfunction, abdominal pain and hyponatremia is for five years. And I picked that up in my private practice five years back. So, so your pearls of neurology are excellent. but. There must have been a lot of lessons you must have learned in medical practice. It's not only about science. So, uh, any any specific thing or anything which you want to talk about, what you learned uh, uh, being a doctor, being a neurologist, lessons that you learned in medical practice per se. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are uh, some of the hard facts. And I think the quicker we learn it, better it is. Mm -hmm. I think we start off thinking that our science is uh, advanced. It is advanced. But that it is reaching completion or it is complete and we should, we should be able to know what's happening to the people and treat them. But we are far away from that. I mean, we all know that we know up to a point and there is a real lot that we don't know. So, what I actually learnt over the years is this gap between uh, what my books say and what the, the patient actually will be wanting to, wanting to get. And bridging that gap uh, is something where your skills develop. So to the best of your capacity, you try and do what, uh, what will make the person comfortable. In the early years, Google had not come in. Now Google has come in. So that has changed a lot. You've got uh, very informed individuals now who come and, uh, come and meet you. So that has changed how uh, one uh, sort of looks at this gap. But I think it, it was the incompleteness of the science that was the real challenge to assimilate and say, okay, see, originally when you're young, you think if you don't know, you will go to somebody and that somebody will know. But then slowly you know that well, it is an incomplete science. And then what do you do? There are individuals who are suffering, who are coming to you, then how do you manage? So, so the learning is about working with an incompletely explored science to still try and be helpful to people who come. 
And another thing which I have been uh, witnessing in the last couple of years since I am so closely associated with you, uh, with day-to-day -day, uh, work and also with work of myology and nerve and muscle diseases, is that you are becoming more and more philosophical now. <laughs> you were philosophical even during my DM days, but uh, this is more. And quite often but not, I hear you say that, obviously we know that you are at the peak of your uh, career and there is still much more to come uh, and you are solving difficult cases as if they are as simple as looking at GPS patients. But you say that now you are selling hope. Yeah, I, I am a seller of hope. Uh, can you can you elaborate a bit on that? And this is something which I am very sure our viewers would like to hear. I mean, how, how does your whole life transform from being a, a knowledge gatherer, from a person who uses it that knowledge to treat patients, and from a person who then starts healing patients? Yeah. So, can you tell us briefly about your journey about this? I think you touched upon a very very important aspect, which I think we uh, it's good to discuss it a little. You know, like, like you said, you start as a knowledge gatherer. You start as somebody who, who thinks he's knowledgeable and who thinks that by virtue of his knowledge he'll help. And then you realize that that doesn't happen all the time. It happens many times, like simple epilepsy, simple this, simple that, you treat them. And you, into an order commas, cure them. But when you really see what's coming in front of you, it, it is dis-ease in a very broad sense that they are uneasy with what is happening to them. And that's not necessarily only the medical medium. So there is a person having a disease, whereas you have been focusing on the disease only. You have to now look at the person who has the disease. And for in that, everybody is different. Their social situation is different, their financial situation, everything is different. So, a successful consultation really is when the patient walks out of your room feeling happier than the way he came in. They come in with problems, some that you can solve, some that you cannot solve. So the art with which you make them feel more comfortable when they leave the room than when they came in is what develops with time and all of us develop it in our own ways. Like um, Everyone loves to swim once they are thrown in water. We are all thrown in this thing and then we, then we learn. But I think that is a more important part of the whole thing. And because science finally meets philosophy. All sciences meet philosophy. So, I mean, philosophy has to develop in all of us uh, sometime or the other. And nothing better than medical science to develop. In many ways, nothing better than medical science because you have been provided an opportunity by life to help others officially. You are also charging for it and making your living. So if you want to use it in that way to, for your self-evolution, I think it is a fantastic field to, to do that. And that seems to be emerging a little bit. Now, as you become more and more senior and as the practice goes on developing, you are moving from you know, first you are the first neurologist. This is your clinic. That's why we came. And then you see them and your hammer is there. You make a diagnosis. He is happy. You are happy. You made the diagnosis. <laughs> so first few years go in making the diagnosis and feeling happy about it. You come on and say, oh, I made a, a diagnosis. Then you say, okay, I'm supposed to do that. I mean, I, that's what I'm trained for. So that joy starts reducing. <laughs> But then patients coming to you start coming for a second opinion. Then they want to know more as to what has been done, what more can be done. So you evolve in that manner. And then I think as practice goes on, a stage comes where diagnosis has been made, all investigations have been done, patient is completely Google informed, but he has come to ask you, will anything good happen? That's what I mean by I'm selling hope. Yes. Then I tell them, look, miracles can happen. This may happen, don't get disappointed. So I think these are stages of practice where you evolve as a practitioner. And depending on how uh, junior or senior you are in that uh, hierarchy, different type of works keeps coming to you. So currently uh, that type of work is coming where uh, they want to know whether there is any hope. And truly hope is independent of reality. Yeah. You can keep hoping for the best. Yes. Who's prevented you from hoping for the best? <laughs> excellent, excellent message. That hope is actually different from reality. That's that's great. Uh,
ओके थरिंकर वी आर कमिंग टू अ कपल ऑफ मोर पॉइंट्स बिफोर वी रैप इट अप सो वी हैव ऑलवेज सीन यू राइट न्यूमरस चैप्टर्स यू कंट्रीब्यूटेड टू न्यूमरस बुक्स यू हैव रिटन बुक्स सो यू ऑथर्ड पीयर वेरियस आर्टिकल्स इन पीयर रिव्यू जर्नल्स and you have an enviable collection of articles you google your name and it goes on to four or five pages now most of us actually like to look at this in a very very different way we we do it as a goal related thing that we have to write this article we have to write two articles this is good for your career so what what would be your message i mean obviously we know that this is your by product of the work that you put by all these years for you patient care always comes first and all the literature that has come from them is your hard work that you put in for the patient but there are not many who look at that way people look at paper in a purely scientific way so what what would be your advice for those who want to do practice who want to care for their patient and also at the same time leave a mark in the academic field of that okay you very you touched upon a very very important point i think when you're starting off in your career you're more involved with what you're doing and therefore you may want to do one or two works that so fat in your bio data so to say and make you more eligible to get whatever you want to do but really speaking in a country like ours what help helps patients is what should be put in literature so when you practice and you see what are the issues that they're facing choosing one of those issues and then trying to keep data and writing about it probably is something that each one of us can do only choose what in his given area he sees patients which were bothered by x y z and can you do something about it so the what i understood is that what helps the people you need to focus on that like we took leprosy up because yes. we saw that leprosy uh, is something that's everywhere yes and um, very little is done about it and nobody wants to work with leprosy as you yes. know uh, every time you say you ask a dm student we want to work on leprosy no, and say no, no. work on tuberculosis no but i think those are the areas say tuberculosis is yes. so much unexplored so i think all of us are clinicians we work with patients and if we want to also do some writing we have to take one part of a common disease that is troubling patients and actually work scientifically on it that's the easiest way of producing useful material that's good one so uh, you had you had given us a lot of uh, uh, path breaking ideas you have uh, brought about a lot of uh, innovative scientific methods you look and try to interpret them like the hirayama disease how the long neck contributes to the patients with hirayama disease uh, can you tell us a couple of words on your work about agarwals and uh, muscle disease yeah it has a lot of social implications so i think the audience should be aware of oh, yeah see yeah again an important point see, in a large country like ours which is a resource strapped country if you want to put a blanket project like all genes for all myopathies and then i look what is where it's not going to be a reality on the other hand when agarwal started coming they had this scapula winging and things so in some ways their limb girdle muscular dystrophy is looked a little different from the standard muscular dystrophy so i started keeping them aside in fact i started keeping aside the uh, upper girdle dystrophies thinking that i'll work on upper girdle dystrophies and then i realized that la- a large number of them were agarwals so then that sort of got tied up scapula winging uh, ad ductor weakness agarwals so then we kept 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 on collecting them and then it, when a genetic facility came along we got it done and then it turned out to be two found mutations now when i started doing that work it started with upper girdle dystrophy then the agarwals were found more in uh, in in that group and then we chased them up then read about the agarwals and their gotras yes. and everything and two founder mutations came now this sort of work has direct implication so i think in a country like ours trying to put a very broad blanket project is too ambitious and probably may not bear fruit early on the other hand trying to take up something like this where see now there are so many other ones who do antenatals yes who do um, pre marriage counseling like there was recently a lady who had three daughters of marriageable age who were carriers 
she made sure that every time the groom has the test done and that the disease will not go away. So it's direct health. So those type of efforts are uh, fulfilling in many ways, scientifically as well as um, socially. So one would encourage this type of activity because we are, ours is a very large country and a poor country. You can't say I tag all limbers. So this is the way to move forward. You identify a group of diseases, say probably in a small community and then work towards the yes. betterment of the society. Within India, there are little, little genetic little, Yes, little, little genetic diseases. Yes, well said. So we have covered a vast aspect of your career, your academic life, uh, your preschool days. Just before we uh, wind up, uh, I know that you are an avid reader. Uh, I know that you have a lot of other hobbies and uh, other hobbies which I am very sure my audiences don't know. Uh, you are a good photographer, you are a painter. So would you like to elaborate about what are you reading currently? <laughs> Obviously not a medical book <laughs> and any other hobby which comes very close to you and uh, you still like to pursue with passion. I will first tell about the hobby. Uh, amongst various things that I have pursued as hobbies and they have been very like uh, bird stuffing. Yeah, bird stuffing. What's that? And you kill the bird <laughs> <laughs> and you stuff it so that you can keep it. As a very young boy, I did it, but I, I'm sorry that I did it. You know, it's terrible when you kill the bird. Just because you can aim with the rifle, you kill them because you have a rifle. I had a small air gun and killed bird. That's a very short span. So, there have been very photography, yes. Of course, cameras are not so developed when I was interested in it, but yes. The one hobby that I'll mention is painting. And I thoroughly enjoy it. And I'll tell you why I enjoy it. There's no competition involved. <laughs> I, my drawing doesn't have to be better than anyone else's. No, no competitive element enters there. It's just hobby. I have done something. Others may think it is third class. It doesn't matter. So it gives me a lot of good feeling having done some and I've tried various mediums and, and stuff. And that's one thing that I, uh, pure joy. Pure joy, not associated with any tag or any certificate. And then reading. To tell you the truth, my reading has uh, moved on to uh, completely to philosophy. And uh, that too, I'm currently doing a course in Vedanta. Yeah. Where, uh, I'm actually a student again. And I take lessons and try and give exams. And, and I, I find that that science, I, I will call it science, uh, though most of us don't explore it, it has far wider implications than our small science of medicine. So I, I wish I had started on that much earlier. And, uh, it, it, the days are very nice because everything is on Google. Yeah. And everything is on that uh, Kindle. So whatever you want, you can get at very cheap rate. So I think this is a great time for people who like to read. Everything is there. I mean, like whatever cross-references I require for this class, I can get them uh, immediately and, and look at them and read them. Also, it amazes me how different people think differently and how intelligent they are and how they think about the world differently. So the reading has completely gone on. That slightly made a, a bit of a problem in my daily life that I'm still a teacher. Last few years of uh, medical teaching, I still registered EM students. But to tell them how the reflex is exaggerated out of plantarism, I'm finding it very <laughs> boring. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and often what is catching my attraction, uh, my attention is useless to them. So there is a bit of a problem. Like somebody referred a patient to me with a odd type of muscular dystrophy with the question, what is this dystrophy? And the moment I saw him, a very dark colored Parsi came in. I've never seen a dark Parsi. What's happening here? So the type of dystrophy went to one side and I started chasing, can there be dark Parsi? And I found that they can be and how they can be. <laughs> so that's useless for the DM student. So I think a change occurs as a teacher also. And 
there i'll make one other point i think i appreciate attitude more than competence now for for quite a few years now competence can come if you have enough uh, there and you apply yourself competence can come but uh, the attitude and if i see good attitude in a student i know that he or she is going to go far and they'll get their training from wherever so i think this attitude versus competence thing is heavily tilted now in my mind uh, to attitude which wasn't so very early on. Yes. So it was a pleasure chatting with you, Dr. Khadilkar. We learned a lot about you, Dr. Khadilkar, the physician, Dr. Khadilkar, the neurologist, Dr. Khadilkar, the philosopher, Dr. Khadilkar, the sports person, Dr. Khadilkar, the academic chef, and uh, uh, many more to come, I'm sure. Uh, before we end this uh, lovely chat, uh, would there be a parting message for especially our young viewers or neurologists in making. Uh, obviously, you told us a lot, a lot about attitude in life, a lot about how you be with your patients, but anything as a parting message to them? I think optimism. They have to be optimistic that good things will happen right. and work, work for it. Don't let the cynical old person bother them <laughs> with, the, with the attitude issues. No, they have to keep a good attitude, they have to be optimistic that good things will happen and a lot of good things will happen because the science is progressing and they, they are getting an opportunity to be a part of that progress, much more than the previous generation. So they have to be optimistic. But there is so much today to do and to see and to imbibe that they have to be organized. I think unless they organize, they prioritize what they want to do and in an optimistic way do them. I think sky is the limit. I think this is the time to be in the world. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank Professor you. Kadikar, for this wonderful chat. I hope to meet you soon again. Thank you. Thank you, viewers. Thank you. Musafir hu yaro Na ghar hai na thikana चलते जाना है बस चलते जा जाना
प्यारो न घर है न ठिकाना मुझे चलते जा है बस चलते जा 